yet another interview uh, with the candidates who have contested races in the May 15th primary. And uh, I have Thomas Bruno, who is running against Al Alan Zelenka, who is the incumbent. And the other person we interviewed uh, earlier is Hugh Patterson. So it's a three-way race in that uh, particular um, ward. But uh, welcome to Community Television. And let's start with the, with the first basic question. Who are you and where'd you come from? <laughs> uh, I'm Tom Bruno. Yep. And I was born in uh, actually Mather Air Force Base right after World War II. Okay. But my dad was stationed at McClellan. And then uh, we moved to Ohio, to Virginia, okay. to Florida, back to Virginia. And then my dad retired and we went to Sacramento. Actually, Carmichael, he worked at Aerojet General. Okay. So I finished my sophomore, junior, and senior year of high school. Mm -hmm. And um, I was a pretty good baseball player. Okay. And I got drafted uh, to play baseball. But as they said, I was the only guy that could hit a triple and still be thrown out at first base. My dad, yeah. my dad wanted me to go to the Air Force Academy. Right. And uh, I didn't apply for college. Okay. Uh, have some money. Have to study. Could date. No date. Drive a Corvette. Not drive a Corvette. Right. So I didn't go to, and so I didn't even apply. And then when I got cut uh, after a Cactus League uh, summer, I applied for American River Junior College, went two years junior college there. So. Then I went to the University of Kentucky for two years. And um, after my four-year deferment was up, my local board said, we want you to come and join the military. Okay. So I had uh, four years of college, but I didn't have a degree because I was going to be a pre-med. I was going to be a dentist. I'd been accepted. And... Uh, Strange fates, uh, I went in the Army, ah. and uh, as a E-5, I went to OCS, got commissioned, mm -hmm. and uh, then served 22 years. My last basic year and a half, I spent in and out of Walter Reed with some operations. Mm. And uh, I started a business called Bruno Associates. We did uh, logistics engineering. I worked for Oak Ridge Labs, Mattel Labs. I worked for some Fortune 500 companies, yeah. and I got uh, I used all those biology, chemistry, and physics courses to good use, and I became actually kind of one of the early adopters of radio frequency identification. Mm. And I okay. sat on all these standards committees and got linked up with uh, some professors at the University of Pittsburgh. We worked with the automated uh, manufacturing, mm. worked with the... Um, Automotive Industry Action Group, yeah. the Consumer Electronics, and I got into the testing evaluation completely independent. And then that kind of grew, and then I started doing some systems integration. And the last big job I did was for the Navy. They have 500-bed hospitals. So imagine um, Riverbend Hospital right. putting all of Riverbend Hospital into 450 20-foot and 40-foot containers, that's all the MRI machines, that's all the beds, yeah. that's all the sheeting, all the surgical instruments, and be able to start setting it up in 15 days. Yeah. And so we had to have all the power, all the sewage, and uh, that's where I hired a lot of the engineers from Oregon State uh, mm -hmm. to come up with ideas and designs, use uh, professors at Pittsburgh, uh, Nebraska, University of Texas, and so I got real familiar with how good engineers were and how creative and how imaginative these guys are. You're not just you're not just funning with me there. No, I'm serious. <laughs> yeah. They um, they uh, well, Dr. Porter, who's up at Oregon mm -hmm. State. Yeah. His RFID testing is how he got his PhD, both in industrial engineering. And he had to go back and work with Dr. Marlon Mickle um, in electrical engineering because it was kind of a cross mm -hmm. with doing all the different testings with the different frequencies, active tags, passive tags, and that sort of stuff. So mm -hmm. 
when Dr. Porter got hired as a PhD and I was still doing a lot of RFID stuff, I said, that's the guy I want to go to. And so uh, yeah. David and I remain, remained friends for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. And we got into barcodes. I was on a lot of the standards committees for UPS, FedEx, mm -hmm. the quality of barcodes. But like I said, the, um, the one uh, for the Navy, these 500-bed hospitals, we started marking surgical instruments. We had to go to different hospitals mm -hmm. and figure out what procedures they did, how they did their cleaning of surgical instruments, and so it turned out to be pretty successful. Uh, I got sick again, mm -hmm. and they figured out that I had a lung fungus, and which prevented that I couldn't uh, drive or fly or anything, and I was just basically a vegetable. And um, so I sold the company to the employees, mm -hmm. so it continued to continue to operate. And just about a year before, um, I started another company, a quality company. It was a manufacturing execution software company called okay. QCR. Um, and quality is really what I'm about, is conformance to requirements. Right. And a lot of people don't teach or train in quality. Mm -hmm. Everybody's familiar with dimming, but the individual that really started quality was uh, Philip Crosby, a podiatrist. You know, if you walk straight, you're going to have good, good alignment. So um, Deming was one of his consultants, and a guy that was married to my cousin, Mike Young, mm -hmm. was also like that. And uh, so I formed, started the company. Mike was the president. And we created some software that mistake-proof processes. Okay. And Abbott Labs used it to uh, manufacture their medical devices. The Joint Strike Fighter, Lockheed mm -hmm. Martin used it. So it, you can put circuits together any method. Right. We would test them 100% before they went to the floor. Mm -hmm. If the urinalysis hadn't been done on somebody, the computer wouldn't turn on. And that was a good and bad because the labor force had to do certain things. The union had to do certain things. Management had to do certain things. But the, the way they structured the contract was if the management hadn't done it, the, the guy was going to get paid. And if he wasn't uh, trained on version two or three, yeah. the machine wouldn't come on if he didn't have a safety strap. So we slowed down the production line of about 20%. And um, we had the Undersecretary of the Army come in, and they briefed him with Lockheed mm -hmm. Martin and a bunch of other people and said, well, we produced over 500 to 750,000 items on a medical device, mm -hmm. and in two and a half years, we've not had one come back except one, and it was run over by a forklift. Yeah. So you can improve on quality, and you can do it right. Yeah. Um, in the 50s, 57, my dad went to Patrick Air Force Base, and so I got to see all the missiles blowing up. I got to see all the space race stuff, and so... Yeah. That kind of has always been in my mind. Expensive failures back then, many uh, of them. Very expensive <laughs> failures. Yeah. So I noticed that you have this pin on your uh, lapel. So tell me about that. Well, it's, you do things crazy. I was making $62.50 a month in the Army. Yeah. And if I went well, to jump was school... was a while ago. <laughs> So if you went to jump school, you got $55 a month. Yeah. That was a car payment back then. Mm -hmm. So I volunteered to go airborne. Yep. And um, in my particular enlisted MOS, I was a corporal, which mm -hmm. was an E-4. But when you got to be an E-5, it was a specialist. Yeah. Well, as an E-4, you could go to the NCO club. But as an E-5, you couldn't because I was a spec five, not a sergeant. Right. So I came in ranting and raving at the first sergeant, and he says, well, you got four years of college. You can go to OCS, and then you go to the officer's club. So that's kind of how you ended up going to the yeah. OCS. Cool. Okay. Um, so I guess uh, that's sort of where you came from. Uh, so why are you running? What inspired you? What 
What was that thing that said, I got to do this? Well, you remember that comment I made about uh, Corporal and Spec 5? Yeah. <laughs> the Capitol Hill PUD, mm -hmm. it's a plan unit development up at, near Hendricks Park. And the applicant is trying to go from five houses to 34 dwellings. Right. And so I became the co-chair of the Capitol Hill PUD Response Committee. Okay. And once I started getting involved and involved, involved, and started reading the regs and reading why things were turning out the way they did, and I'm very concerned about the environment. Mm -hmm. And when you start cutting down over 450 trees, all five of the five foot in diameter trees, I guess it's 18 of the 21 four yeah. foot in diameter trees, you start getting a little bit more agitated and you, the only person who can make yourself mad is yourself, but you start really getting, and so we produced uh, about a 267 page document Mm -hmm. fighting all the failure to conform to requirements. Right. Um, I understand governments and that sort of stuff, but the city allowed uh, the applicant to use a landscape architect to tell us about trees and things like that, but we hired a forester who yeah. understands the forest and all that, but they're not qualified. Right. And so I'm just, we started getting more and more involved in the different issues. And um, so that kind of tweaked my interest in them to say, well, this doesn't seem right. This just doesn't seem right. And then you, you take in with what the city did with the independent auditor. Yep. Uh, you look at uh, city hall that's now just basically yeah, that's a rubble. A that's a travesty. Well, and again, I'm just, you know, these things are, I mean, I did, a, did all right in life. I retired at the age of 59. Yeah. You know, I, I like to travel. I got my kids, uh, you know, through school and that sort of stuff. Got them married. You know, they're not coming home. <laughs> so this is really more of giving back to the community. Uh, yeah. That's why I'm running. Yeah. And I've told uh, the city hall people I'm not going to take a salary. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use that money either to uh, fund grad students because I really love grad students and PhDs mm -hmm. um, because that's the youth of the future. Yeah. One of the things that I've done recently is I have a family friend that I used to play baseball with him. He was in high school. He went to the Naval Academy, played baseball. And he gave $100 million to the Habitat for Humanity. Mm. He gives 2,000 uh, homes to low-income people per year. Mm. And um, I've kind of followed his model of what he's done in Atlanta, right. Dallas, and um, Denver. And I'm you know, trying to get some ideas what we could do for Eugene, some of the policy issues. But my concept is take a pot of money, about $35 million is what I've kind of built a modeling plan on. And you hire professors and grad students, mm -hmm. and you say, okay, your challenge is to evaluate, determine, analyze, and write textbooks on how to do this. Um, work with the school board, because mm -hmm. this is what Ronnie did, is they hired students from the high school. Yeah. And they built, they were the workers, they'd go to school for four hours, and then they would get hired for eight hours, they paid them minimum wage. What I've done is I've kind of kicked it in that I think we can pay $12 an hour mm -hmm. for these high school kids. The criterion for the high school kids, they have to stay in school. Right. And so they get a skill as an electrician, mm -hmm. as a plumber, as a framer, a roofer, sheet rocker. But what they did in Dallas and what they did in Denver, and I don't have all the specs on uh, Atlanta yet, 
but the interior designers, they had mm -hmm. people that made the cabinets, yep. they made the curtains, they made the furniture, and then when they sold that house, it went right back to uh, the trust. Right. And so I'm thinking that the biggest issue, I think, in Eugene is the land. It's approximately about $200,000, $150,000 for a lot. Right. And so when you start looking at the natural cues, I'm going, we got to figure out how to get the price of the land down. There's a new company in uh, Belgium, and Walmart is building their factory or their headquarters. Mm -hmm. It's going to come in 40-foot long sections, 8 by 8, and they're going to be able to build something like Matthew Knight Arena in seven days. It's all pre-construction, mm -hmm. pre-formed. And so uh, Walmart is looking to maybe partner with Yellow Pine people and start manufacturing manufactured homes. These are high-end yeah. techniques, mm -hmm. but it's the labor that you're going to need the high school kids to put together. So I'm, I'm thinking a little bit further out than yeah. near-term jobs. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, one of the problems that we have talking about high schools, okay, is you are sitting in a studio that used to be the wood shop. Okay. Well, my favorite teacher in high yeah. school um, was mechanical drawing, and I was a transfer. Oh, you, you too, huh? <laughs> I, I had Mr. Stankowski, <laughs> well, who did, who did uh, draft, thought drafting classes. Yeah, well, I learned later yeah. that his name was Dr. Pavan, mm -hmm. and he had a Ph.D. from Caltech in nuclear engineering. Hmm. But when I was a sophomore... You know, I was doing geometry and, you know, before class, and what are you doing? he cut it out. You know, when I got to calculus, he'd go, he'd cut it out, and I'd have physics classes, you know, and he'd tell me how to do all this stuff. I'd go, how do you know all this stuff? And he told me about the downsizing of the nuclear regulatory industry, and he went back to school yeah. in Iowa, and he got a teacher certificate. Nobody knew yeah. that he had a Ph.D., but this was his love. And uh, Mr. Bavon probably stopped me from doing a lot of dumb things. Uh, but, you know, he just very detailed. And so I've always thought that if I could do something to kind of pay respect to him, that's where I thought the, the high school kids. But it's being in the military... You know, you you learn how to deal with people from the inner city. You have to train them, mm -hmm. and you got to rely on them. You got to have them on your left flank, and your flight right flank, and the weakest link is that weakest person. And so you train them, you teach them, mm -hmm. you cuddle them, and uh, you know it's like a football coach. Yeah, the, the players are out there. They're the guys that are doing the work, but you're you're the mastermind. So I. Uh, I think it's a travesty that we don't have a shop here. Yeah, it really is. The, um, I mean, we don't even have video classes at this point. In the, and it, it, it's, just, it's a shame. Yeah. yeah, community television used to share this, and uh, I've been sort of their techno geek. It's all volunteer here, and I've been their techno geek for the last dozen years. But I used to just maintain it for, there's a woman named Pam Cruselli who used to teach video classes. And, you know, just making sure that the studio was functioning for her. And then uh, CTV would use it at night. And, but that disappeared, uh, I guess, 2010. So we're going on, what, eight years? They haven't had video classes. And, like, I made a couple of attempts to put a club together. Um, but the thing that really struck me was the number of kids who just weren't going to do anything. And that, I think, is... Um, you know, you have an opportunity here. You can, you know, make short films. You can do this. You can do this. You can do this. What are you going to do? It, 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 you have to be exposed to a lot of different things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why I pushed both my kids to get liberal arts degrees, even though they both went into scientific studies. Yeah. But they both said having that liberal arts background mm -hmm. gave them a lot of uh, ability to see besides left and right. Yeah. 
While we're talking about high schools, yeah. if I could, uh, I've been doing some research. I, we have a really issue with guns in schools, and yeah. uh, I've been talking to a lot of dog handlers and mm-hmm. and trainers, and I've been I just came back from a trip visiting uh, some cousins in East Texas. Mm-hmm. And we're pursuing the feasibility, the cost analysis of bringing bomb dogs to schools. Okay. And one of the things that I've learned is a bomb dog and training two handlers is about fifteen to eighteen thousand dollars. Right. And that includes all the training. Things that I did not know is bomb dogs can detect stuff at almost to like 90 feet. Yeah. And if you have shotgun shells, AK-47, M16 rounds, you can get up to 10 to 15 feet. Yeah. And so that's a low cost. The dogs can, as they do in some of East Texas, mm-hmm. they go through the parking lots. Yep. And a dog can be trained for whatever you're looking for. Okay. And so I'm thinking that, you know, maybe with some of this trust money, we work with the Board of Education and we do a couple of tests, mm-hmm. see if it's viable. Yeah. Because if you don't test things, you don't know what the good or the bad, or, and that's what I did, you know, is a lot of independent verification and validation. Mm-hmm. But just think how great that would be for kids at school. The other thing that I learned about drug dogs was you can teach a dog not to alert on marijuana. Right. You know, so you can teach it just strictly for opioids, Mm -hmm. or you can do it for money, or you can do it for whatever. And I'm going, you know, let's think out of the box and think how to protect our kids. Well, there's a lot lot of talk about protecting the kids, and, and the Florida shooting triggered quite a bit of political activity but and I guess you know for a little bit of background I've been sort of a good leftist for most of my my entire life Um, in the sense that you know I voted Democrat 11 times twice for Ralph Nader Um, so but then I start looking at the um, say gun issue in schools And you start doing a little bit of research, and you discover that of the school shootings, okay, more than two-thirds of them are a single suicide. Some kid comes into the into the hallway, (coughs) just blows their brains out. Why are they doing that? Okay, so that's problem number one. So that's more than two-thirds of the of the of the school shootings. Um, Another thing that's so I think if we answer that question, that we probably will get a better solution on the gun problem in schools. I also look at, uh, say, another piece of information. Uh, London just recently exceeded New York in terms of its homicide rate. There's not very many guns in London. Okay? So most of those homicides are now are knives. Okay? And in fact, it goes to the point of gangs running around with machetes hacking each other. Um, so Sadiq Khan, who is the mayor of London, is now advocating knife control. Okay. So the question is, um, is, is the problem guns, or is there some other problem that's bringing this to the surface that maybe we ought to solve the other problem that's the, under, the, the root cause, rather than looking at the guns themselves? You can call me old-fashioned. Yeah. I had a wonderful education. Mm -hmm. My classes were very small. Yeah. And I have uh, cousins that are teachers. Yep. I have cousins that are principals. I have cousins that are sheriffs. So Mm -hmm. my point is, based on my military training, Right. I believe especially with grandkids. You know, I got four grandsons mm-hmm. and a granddaughter and they're all completely different. Yep. But I believe first through third grade shouldn't have any more than six kids in that class. 
because they need to learn that socialization oh, yeah. at that particular time. Mm -hmm. Now, my daughter who went to college in Kentucky, she calls me up and says, Dad, there are people in my school that have never been out of the state of Kentucky. And, she, you know, she's lived in Germany, you know. Well, that's actually pretty normal. Well, I mean, there's a lot of people in this city who've never been well, out of I'm Oregon. Well, I'm just saying. Yeah. So the issue with kids, I think, begins at the socialization level. Absolutely. The other thing that I believe, and my sister's a retired nurse and mm -hmm. president of the uh, Nurses uh, Association for six years, and she also was on the school board. Mm -hmm. See, I believe you should have a registered nurse at all the elementary, junior high, mm -hmm. and I really think you ought to have a doctor at the high school because that's the first point of contact where the doctors can mm -hmm. find identification if somebody's having a skin disease or they're having some sort of thing. So I think just a little bit differently outside the box. People say, well, you can't afford it, you can't afford it. Well, there are people and philanthropists that will do things like that. Yeah. And um, so I think you have to really study an issue, mm -hmm. but you have obviously a scientific background. You define the problem. Yep. You have all the attributes or whatever mm -hmm. discussions. You come up with a course of action yeah. with positives and negatives. You know, you make a recommendation, and then you test it. Yeah. And if it works, great. If you have a failure, you can refine your failure, and that's how we got up into space with all those failures. <laughs> yeah. And failure, yeah. we seem to have a negative context about that, but you can learn a lot from a failed uh, project. Yeah. But I think you have to do it scientifically, problem discussions, recommendations, courses well, of action. You have to separate your variables. You oh, yeah. Have to, you know, there's, there's a whole series of, of techniques that are referred to as the scientific method that allow you to be more effective at learning from your mistakes. You, you said you were uh, very democratic, uh, very... Uh, well, left, left. left. I, don't, I don't really what do you identify... Know, what do you know about Gary Davis? Do you know much about Gary Davis? The name doesn't ring a bell. G-A-R-R-Y Davis. That's a homework assignment for you. Okay. I think you'll find that he was... Uh, so who is he? He... Um, I'm not very good with names, so it's entirely possible that I'm aware well, he was, who he is. He was a bomber pilot in World War II. He was a song... He was in vaudeville, song and dance man. Yeah. Was in different plays and things. Gary Davis um, got wrapped up in the military. Mm -hmm. He was a bomber pilot in Dresden. Yes. And he just leveled it. Yep. I, think, I think I am aware of the person. I've, I've heard this and story. And he created his own yeah. world passport. Mm -hmm. And after the war, he gave up his U.S. citizenship, went to Paris yeah. for three years while the U.N. was trying to uh, uh, form the U.N. And, right. and so he stormed the U.N. with his friends Camus, Sartre, Kiltegaard, the, all the existentialists, and um, Eleanor Roosevelt said it was because of Gary Davis that we got all the human rights because the Russians kept fighting it. And so they've just created yeah. a um, movie about Gary Davis. And mm -hmm. so I've, uh, I, got, I got a chance to preview it cool. early. And uh, I highly recommend it so, to everybody. So you, th you think it's going to be a hit, huh? It's a documentary. Yep. The thing is, I know one of the production people, mm -hmm. and getting all those archive videos, mm -hmm. very expensive. Oh, yeah. And so they're trying to collect money so that they can update it and get more of his, his background stuff. And right. uh, so I guess you can say that I'm a little bit more cosmopolitan than uh, just straight military. I mean, the military was very good to me. I learned a lot from the military, well, I, I don't, but I'm just saying that... Yeah, I, don't, I don't think there's any need to defend <laughs> a, a career in the military. Well, you know, my so. son my son went to medical school, yeah, and he felt that because his great-grandfather had fought in World War I as, you know, my dad, World War II, me, uh, that he was the uh, ICU 
He ran the ICU mm -hmm. uh, at Bagram Air Force for right. one tour. And he said that, you know, he had done his thing and now he's in private practice, so. Yeah. Well, no, there's, um, military is an honorable profession. So I don't have a problem with that at all. But, uh, yeah, getting back. Um, to the election? Well, we could get back to the election, but these are all relevant issues. I, mean, I think whether, so. Whether we're talking, you know, even, because how, okay, for example, right now, uh, community television has been here for 36 years. They've never had a problem with anyone at the school for community television. The current solution to keeping people safe is that now everyone here who comes to use the studio, and we actually had to go through phone calls to get the candidates not to have to do this, has to go through a background check. At one point there was this discussion that you had to be fingerprinted, okay, uh, but that's been, they backed off of that. And um, we have to go through this uh, training, which is essentially, um, I'm going to say it's social justice indoctrination. You have to regurgitate their talking points back to them, otherwise you fail the test and you're not allowed to come in here anymore. Okay, that's not a solution. So, and the other thing you have to do is every time you show up, you have to sign in at the main office. So I've been doing support for, for this, com this television station for free, supporting the school for 12 years, okay, and they're going to force me through that crap? And that's not a solution to their problems about keeping the kids safe, because getting back, say, to the guns, okay, um, the gun is a way to, to off yourself. Two, more, fully two-thirds of all school shootings is a, single, is a single suicide, and I think we need to look at the question of why it is that those kids are getting into the middle of the hall and blowing their brains out. And if we answer that question, then we'll be able to deal with the safety thing at the schools. The lawyers uh, yeah. make you go through this thing. It's not the because lawyers. It's a, it's a new administration. Yeah, a new liability. administrator. Yeah. We'll give you a, a project that I worked on. Yeah, well, we're already paying uh, quite a bit of money for a, a multi-million dollar liability insurance policy for this station even to start with. Yeah. Um, right after I retired, yeah. I was told to evaluate different technology. Mm -hmm. So I would hire grad students, undergraduates to, to break it. Yep. Well, the Italians haven't had the country of Italy, haven't had a bank robber in X number of years. Right. And they have a portal mm -hmm. that you walk through and it does all the scanning similar to what they're trying to do uh, at the airports. Yeah, I just went to Las Vegas for NAB. They made me take my shoes off and yeah. belt and but all that. But I'm just saying, this was done in 93, 94 time frame. Yeah. So I looked at buying um, into the technology. Right. So we set up a test in downtown Washington, D.C., outside a liquor store. Yeah. Thinking that you know, it would stop robberies and that sort of stuff. Well, the people that fought it the most, FBI, Secret Service, and all the undercover police because it stopped them from doing their job. Mm -hmm. You know, we were going to do it at the White House. You know, everybody comes up with a... But another project was yeah. infrared technology, do a facial scan. Mm -hmm. We got a test from NIST um, to test it mm -hmm. for Congress. And it didn't matter if you grew a beard or you had a scarf on. Right. I could tell the difference. And we learned that a baby born with, uh, with an infrared scan 35 years later, unless they've had cosmetic surgery, you can identify them. Mm -hmm. So we were working with one of the banks to put that as your teller machine so that you didn't have to put in a PIN number and that sort of stuff. Well, we discovered a guy was having a stroke because we could watch it, you know, in real time. And so there are, but you could put, back then it was about $30,000. Now it's probably down to $500 being the camera, you know, is, it was, mm -hmm. was, the, was the natural breaker back then. Oh, yeah. So you can, you could take a system yeah. Once I register you, I can tell you if you're high on drugs or not. 
-hmm. and it doesn't matter. But these are things, you know, what's, what's going to happen in the future? You know, I've talked ad nauseum with my son about medical doctors. They're going to have a computer that you walk through a portal, yep. through synthetic aperture radar or different mm -hmm. MRI scans. Yeah. It's going to tell you you got A positive, your red blood counts such and such. It's just a matter of computer processing yep. and figuring out all the algorithms. But I'm talking to a, a guy that understands that that's available. Yeah. But I agree with you a thousand percent. I think it starts at home. One of the things that I learned from my cousin who's a principal, he mandates all the teachers once a month have to ride the school bus and see where their kids go and get off the school bus. That's an interesting concept. And when the kid didn't turn in his homework, was it because was he was lazy or because he was out hunting trying to get food for, that's just East Texas. Right. And so try to get food. And, I mean, he showed me pictures that the teachers had taken. Yeah. And so until you walk another, you know, a mile in somebody's moccasins, you don't understand it. Mm -hmm. And so he mandates, and, you know, the teachers hate it, but at least they understand. And he says that the teachers work harder and the kids get a little bit of better treatment. Mm -hmm. But I really think, going back to what I said earlier, I think for the first three grades, small classes oh, I agree. are, yeah. because that's where the socialization yeah. becomes. One of my grandsons, my son calls me up and says, Dad, uh, your grandson's probably going to be kicked out of school for fighting. I said, okay, why is he fighting? Well, did you talk to the principal? You know, did you talk to the vice principal? Did you talk to the teacher and the counselors? I said, did you talk to the kids? Well, my grandson, right, wrong, or indifferent, was fighting the bully. Yeah. And so once the bully was gone, you know, he didn't, he just wasn't going to allow a bully to beat up on any of his friends. And yeah. he just, he became you know, that kind of reinforcer. And I'm going, you just have to find the facts. And you've identified, I think, the natural cue for what's happening in high school, junior high, yeah. and socialization. Yeah, we can go back, we can go back and look at this stuff. Um, I don't think that there is a case of a high school shooter who was not being medicated with some form of a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Okay, that's problem number one. Okay, so, you know, Prozac, uh, Ritalin, go through the list of them. Uh, as a side note to that, yeah. uh, I, I visited Tesla mm -hmm. just to yeah. learn about lithium batteries and oh, yeah. why they're doing it. I may be slightly off mm -hmm. with my stats, but about 8% of the workforce... Yeah. is mentally challenged. Mm -hmm. But they get autistic kids and they put them in dorms. Yep. Their food is in microwave and they can and they're getting paid regular pay of an electricians or whatever they're doing on the assembly line. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for more kids yeah. because they and the kids are very happy. Yep. So sometimes you need to think outside the box to figure out how, what you need to do. And that's what they're doing at Tesla. Yeah. People that don't want to work just don't want to work because they've got plenty of work in Nevada. Right. Well, I mean, one of the problems that you have, there's a lot of jobs that are going for asking, okay, at this point. It's been a couple people brought up this statistic. It's like 120,000 jobs in Oregon because they don't have people who have the skills. And they're just looking for entry level. Can you, cut, can you use a table saw? <laughs> can you use a drill press? Can you do those kinds of things? And, you know, that's, that's huge. If we can, you know, get some folks, um, give them the kinds of skills that you used to get when I grew up and went to school in the 1960s, where we had industrial arts, where we had my Mr. Stankowski, um, and who was, you know, the drafting teacher, 
who, you know, I learned quite a bit from. You know, I thought that mechanical drawing was, was uh, it was sort of a gateway to thinking about a variety of other things that I otherwise probably would not have thought of. And so, you know, did some wood shop, did some metal shop. Um, it, it's paid off. I mean, I have those skills today. I may be wrong again in my stats. Yeah. I think there were 162 industrial arts colleges when you and I were in school. Could be, yeah. I think there's four now. Yeah. And that's because we've shipped a lot of these jobs overseas. Well, different. I have a bias in engineering. Yeah. And I have, my wife hates it that I don't like MBAs. Cause well, I, watched I got one, so you can hate <laughs> me for that. I'm just saying that <laughs> I watched Texas Instruments. It was run by years and years yeah. of engineers that bring in MBAs and yeah. Yeah, things it's change. Not, it's not the same. But when you look at Ford, for all of his idiosyncrasies, you know, I got a second education in logistics mm -hmm. uh, from Florida Institute of Technology. So, you know, we studied processes. We studied manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Ford, I think, had 57 different nationalities working for him. Yeah. But he sent his henchmen to go see where you lived and checked on the rent to see if they were charging too much rent or whatever. And so he had a, a group of people that went, and then he put people in a pot, you know, in their native costume. And when they came out, you know, they had you. And he educated yeah. at home so that everybody would speak English. Yeah. The Ford was, Ford was sort of a mixed bag. I if said you, you he at, had he had some so, garbage. So, so we can look we can look at a lot of the positive things, and I think those are all um, to his credit and and had an impact on the society, and I think showed us the way. Um, there were some other things that um, I don't think go down so well in in the history. You know, he did hire uh, Pinkertons to beat up union organizers and some like such. Said, yeah, he was a but, mixed bag. But but when you think about he owned the rubber plantations, he yep. owned the railroad, he owned the steel, he owned the iron ore, yep. you know. The only thing that he didn't own were the tires. Yeah. And that's because his good friend Firestone manufactured. Yep. But then, in the 60s, they started selling off all that stuff, mm -hmm. and Ford got in, in trouble. And that's why they went public, I think, in... 56 or 58, yeah. it would just be privately held. Yeah. But there's, I mean, the U.S. auto industry has a very interesting history. I mean, we, we look, for example, at the decade of the 70s to 80s, um, you know, basically Detroit lost 40% of its market share. And the question is, why did that occur? And, uh, I mean, one of the good examples would be the 55-mile-an-hour speed limit. If you, if you recall uh, from the Watergate hearings, uh, there was some discussion of Nixon's slush fund, and the auto manufacturers had contributed handsomely to that. And so when the first Arab oil embargo came, um, Nixon uh, put out the 55-mile-hour speed limit. Now, did that actually save much energy? If you do the analysis, the answer is no. Okay. Um, for a variety of reasons, and we could go through it. It turns out that less energy was saved in the 55 by the 55 mile an hour speed limit than would have been saved if we outlawed single handle faucets. Because you push the single handle faucet up straight, a little bit of hot water goes through that pipe and then dissipates. And so the question is, how much does it cost you to heat all that water that gets wasted in single handed faucets? And it turned out to be more energy than the 55 mile an hour speed limit would say. But the bottom line on this is when it was announced, literally within the first week, uh, all of the manufacturers, and we had four of them because American Motors was still around at the time, uh, fired their entire quality control departments. And that's when we had that period where cars would rattle as you drove them off the and showroom floor. And that's where Deming and Mike Young and 
all these guys went back in to try to fix. Yep. And they got fed up. One of them went to uh, Japan. Yeah. It's yeah. it's it's interesting because there's a lot of Madison Avenue. Yeah. Ethanol. What a waste of money. Yep. You get about 13 percent less mileage. You get about 18% more carbon dioxide, and you know you're you're going. How much more fertilizer is required? How much more water is required to grow the? You know. Yeah, it was a net loser. It, it, it is a net loser, but money talks. Yeah. It's like the electric car. Here in Oregon, I haven't done the analysis, but probably the electric car is. About equal, but if you have an electric car in New York, Connecticut, where they're using a lot of coal to produce electricity, mm -hmm. it, you're putting more carbon dioxide in the air. Well, one of the advantages to the electric car is that you can, especially now that we have very good quality um, high power MOSFETs, which allow you to, to build higher efficiency controllers. You can get 97, 98 percent efficiency out of the electric controllers. You go back, you know, from when back to when I was first involved in designing some of that stuff. The best you could do was 80, 85 percent because you were using bipolar transistors. Sure. But so that's one area. But the whole drivetrain uh, in electric car, you can get, you know, overall 80 percent or better transfer. The efficiencies are getting better and better. Well, it's not just that, but an internal combustion engine is limited by the Carnot cycle, which means that, that you're limited in terms of the overall efficiency of that heat engine. Yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, yeah. have you read the latest out of MIT in graphene? Uh, no, I haven't read the stuff, but I do understand uh, graphene, graphene technology to well, a degree. Well, MIT, I think, produced Rotus Peeper last week oh. that I was riding back from uh, Kentucky and I met a professor at, uh, at yeah. Boulder. She's mm -hmm. an environmental engineer. And I yeah. said, did you hear about graphene? And, oh, I know all about it. I said, did you read the thing about MIT? Were they able to mass produce it now in a roll? Yeah. Uh, first time. She says, oh, that's a, you know, that's a world change. That's a that's a big thing. She says, what's the link? So I gave it to her the week, and she says, I'll write you, because she's going to challenge your grad students now. On. Yeah. But these are the, that to me is going to bring monumental change mm -hmm. to the environment. I mean, when I was growing up, we had issues with ozone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. We got together. We figured out a plan. And now the ozone, you know, that problem has gone away. We just need, I think, the scientists to get involved and, and let some of the marketeers. But, but the ozone problem was essentially just cleaning up automobile emissions. To you know, some a extent. lot of the photochemical smog problem. Because, I mean, if you look back in, into the 1960s, the average automobile was putting out more than a hundred times as much crud as you get in, out of an automobile today. By the by, the late 1980s, um, some of the multi-valve Japanese engines uh, with all the pollution controls on them, literally the air going into the carburetor was dirtier than the air going out yeah. of the exhaust. But but science did that. Yeah. It was not some political right identity. Well, it was to an extent. In that Detroit's, in that the, the federal government imposed pollution standards, and Detroit said, we're just not going to do it. And Japan said, no problem. And they did it. That's because they had a mindset of, we'll do it because it's our competitive advantage. Exactly. And Ford, General Motors, I mean, the they, they said, we can pay off politicians. Exactly. We'll fight you in court. Yeah. We'll we'll buy politicians, and Japan just did it. That was part of the you know the 55 mile an hour speed limit was one piece of the loss of 40 percent of market share, but the um, uh, you know the the pollution stuff was another. Yeah. That was significant. Uh, just the fact that they got better gas mileage for expensive uh, fuel, another piece. There's a whole series of reasons why 
people said, excuse me, we've had enough of this ossified management that's just building crap products and, and waving the flag to say you have to be patriotic and buy this stuff. Well, look at Mr. Mr. Walton. Yeah. You know, we're going to buy all American. Now you go in his store and you can't find anything that was buy American. You probably remember in the 70s and 80s when you yeah. know, they had American flags on everything that was in the store. Yeah. Not anymore. Yeah, anyway. So why am I running for election? Yeah, exactly. That's the good, that's the, you know. Because I want to bring some of these, I mean, you know, owning two different businesses. Yeah. You know, I wrote contracts, basic mm -hmm. contracts, advanced contract. I read in the paper this morning about uh, a football coach getting X number of dollars. You know, he didn't even have a contract, but Very yet good. they're paying him PERS. Yeah. And I'm going, come on, guys. Santa Clara, you know, with the new 49er football player, football field, you know, they're all going, boy, what are, you know, the people in Dallas, or actually Arlington, that pay, are paying for uh, the football stadium. And I'm going, we got to stop this. And yeah. we got to, if you really want to be for the people, you got to have somebody that's going to speak for the people. And you may or may not be aware of this uh, new law. Uh, 1071, 1051, about uh, secondary dwelling units? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, from, get the political side out of it, what's the mechanical side with all these SDUs now going to do to the sewer system? Yep. So we're kind of based on what the mechanics of the sewer system can handle today, and if you lower the cost of building an SDU, yep. you still have the same amount of toiletry going on, the same. So how are we going to get money to upgrade that infrastructure? Yep. And so this is the things that also in the community, I'm the co-chair of the Laurel Hill Valley, yeah. and we went to the last meeting, and the planning commission is just bypassing us and not asking for our input. And you think that's abnormal? <laughs> well, maybe yeah. I'm na maybe I'm naive. Yeah, okay? exactly. But now that I've been eye-opening with the PUD yeah. process, mm -hmm. um, you're still talking safety. Yeah. And one of the things that identified was that the engineers from the applicant said these two areas. Mm -hmm. Are high layer, high risk for mudslide. Right. Okay. So I sent some stuff off to some buddies, and we hired a, a PhD geotechnical, mm -hmm. and they're going to dig up the trench to put in a sprinkler system with spreaders, and they're going to just break up all this soil that they're saying not to do that. Yeah. So the geotech and some other friends of mine said, you're going to, they do this. They don't do everything exactly perfect. You're going to have a landslide. It's going to take out Floral Hill. It's going to take out Riverview and a portion of Augusta Drive. Mm -hmm. Now, rather than you've got a he said, he said, she said, she said, why not take that, send it to Oregon State, Mm -hmm. and get an independent analysis rather than, well, that testimony is not good because it's in goal five or it doesn't meet this criteria. And you're going, hey, dummies, the thing is safety. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, this whole PUD <laughs> process yeah. uh, is like that. So maybe I'm naive enough. I think the um, 23... Uh, community associations. Mm -hmm. I think we put some backbone together and we said, all right, goal one requires you to come to us. Yeah. But there's another group of people. Remember, I was on standards committees. Mm -hmm. I would watch big companies come in and just delay it until their technology would catch up. You know, I, I've been, been down that road. <laughs> I got the t-shirts. Yeah. And I'm going... 
the space is big enough for everybody. You got to be smart enough to do it right the first time. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I don't have a magic wand to do all this stuff. I did pretty good with my kids. Did I make some mistakes? Yeah. Uh, I got five grandkids. Am I making some mistakes with them? Yeah. Yeah, but, but you're, you're probably pampering them a bunch. <laughs> well, That's, grand, grandpa and grandma are, are are really good for grandkids. I I try to send them. <laughs> Yeah. Things that they're interested in. Yeah. Um, I've got one grandson that loves music. Yeah. So I send him all sorts of stuff about music. Mm -hmm. I got one that just loves baseball, and I send him bats and you know those things. I send him videos and and that sort of stuff. I got one grandson um, that likes dinosaurs, so I send him all the scientific stuff to reinforce mm -hmm. uh, the things that he can do. Yeah. But I'm I'm fortunate. Well, you know, in a lot of ways, running a city or running a county or running a state is kind of like running a family. I mean, it there, is. Are, there are a lot of there are a lot of aspects that really do overlap in terms of the principles. It's the same with the business. I yeah. took a little different model. I paid my employees 25 percent of their salary in their retirement. Yeah. And um, I made them work for me for a year because it cost me X number of mm -hmm. thousands of dollars to put, enroll them in a system. I think back then, we didn't have the phones that we had today, I think I paid them $50 a month mm -hmm. so that I could get a hold of them, because we were all over the world. Yeah, cell um, phones. Well, and I paid them $50 a month. And w the only thing that I had some contention with, I had some employees that had six kids, and I had some employees that were bachelors and bachelorettes. And so I just said, okay, I'll pay $150 a month mm -hmm. for medical. Right. And the ones that had six kids said, well, I need more money. And I'm going, well, what's fair for a person that has no kids? I said, I'm just, I said, I'm trying to make it fair for everybody. Yeah. You get the same 25% of your salary. <laughs> You get the same cell phone, and how many times have I called you? Yeah. You know, it just was one of those things. But so that that became a family, and that's why I sold the company, yeah. you know, to the employees, because I felt like I didn't hire them; the family hired them. Right. And the one employee that got fired, uh, the managers came to me and said, "We want to fire so and so." And I said, "You guys know what my policy is. You hired them. You fired." Them. Yeah, and so they went and fired him. Mm -hmm. And he comes to me and says, "I got fired." And I said, "Well, when you got hired, who hired you? Yeah, who fired you? So what's your complaint? You have to work as a team, and that goes back to sports. Mm -hmm. Everybody, like you articulated, it is a family. Yeah, yeah, we have problems with families." Yes, we do, and we actually have another problem, which is we've run out of time. I'm sorry, I didn't probably <laughs> cover enough on uh, but, the city. But I think you get a philosophy of, yeah, the, of whole, the way I'm thinking. The whole, the whole point is to get to meet you. Well, good. So I want to thank you very much for the interview. It was an a interesting conversation. Learned a little bit. And uh, wish you the best on your campaign. Thank you. Uh, go kick some butt. <laughs> and, uh, and I guess we will see folks during the next interview.